Hello and welcome to the Grow Glide webinar series. Today's webinar is Understanding Your Racking Quote. I'm Will Gonzalez, Director of Marketing and Creative Technology here at GrowGlide, and I'm joined by Caitlin Gorleski, Director of Solutions, and Jesse Porter, Director of Cultivation here at GrowGlide. So guys, before we jump in, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourselves, what you do here at GrowGlide, and also what's what's so important about this topic, understanding your racking boat. Caitlin? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me on, Will. I'm Caitlin, as you mentioned, Director of Solutions, day in, day out, mainly focusing on sales and account manage, uh, account management operations. I'm uh, really excited about this topic, as this is one of the uh, conversations that we have most with our clients is, you know, comparing apples to apples and being intentional with their builds. So really excited to break this down with you guys. Yeah, thanks, Will. Jesse Porter, Director of Cultivation. Um, it's funny when I say this to my friends, they always laugh. I say, I love talking about racking. And they were like, wow, because in the end, these racking conversations lead to the opportunity to talk about how many lights, what your total canopy is, what your fertigation looks like, what your HVAC looks like. You really need to have these racking conversations early on. So, you know, the order of magnitude of design for the facility as a whole. And that work, that's where it gets really fun to me. So getting involved early, talking to our customers, potential customers about, um, the opportunity that they have in front of them and what the impacts are uh, as we start this iterative process. All right. Thanks for the intros. So today we'll be covering everything from floor plans to ROI, really the fundamentals of a racking quote. You know, examining your floor plans, getting intimate with your quote, comparing options, other things to consider such as tax, freight, install, et cetera, and last but not least, cost of ownership. Before we begin, I just want to let all our viewers know that we have a chat window there for some interaction. There's also a button for um, questions and polls. So please submit your questions, um, which we'll be addressing after this presentation. So without further ado, let's get started with floor plans. Caitlin? Yeah, floor plans are really, you know, the nuts and bolts of how we build out your quote. So getting those in hand to your or to our team is really important at the start of the process. Um, and you'll see as we kind of walk through this, we could have two very similar builds um, and it can change in cost everywhere from square footage um, down to how much canopy um, that you're really achieving in that room. Yeah, I think um, to me, I love seeing floor plans. I also love the part before the floor plans where we really meet with our customers and understand what KPIs and metrics are most important. Um, what kind of facility they're building? Is it for extraction? Is it for high grade flower? Um, and really figuring out how we're going to make an impact as a team, as a resource network, and as someone who's helping them put this together. So for me, floor plans to start starts to be where it gets really serious. And we can really figure out what's going to fit in this room, like Caitlin said. And I feel like you bring up a good point there, Jesse, is, you know, solving for pain is at the start of that process. And one thing that we're trying to do with our clients is shift their mindset from, you know, stop thinking about the now and start thinking about what is this facility going to look like in five to 10 years? And what are your goals for the next five to 10 years? So I think that that's kind of all at the start of the process. And I think it's really easy to look at that floor plan and say, hey, this is so easy, right? It's just a square. It's usually more complicated. There's cutouts, there's pillars, there's other things in the room, but that's exactly why we like to get involved early to fully understand. But that said, turn it over and let's take a look at some of these 2D renderings and see what the designs pan out. Yeah, absolutely. I had the team build these out. And the reason why I wanted to get a visual in front of you guys is because, as you said, Jesse, it can seem really simplistic. We're just filling out a, a square or a rectangle with some racks. But you'll see option one and option two vary not only in the square footage that you're achieving, but your overall cost. And so that's where I kind of like to get down to the nitty gritty with clients and be intentional. What are your goals? Are you looking at uh, being uh, maximizing your canopy or being operationally efficient? Or are there certain SOPs that we need to keep in mind as we're building out these rooms? Yeah. And I think in this case, you know, we took a look at it. There's a bunch of different ways to approach it, but two multi-tier cultivation rooms. We have these two rooms. Should we use four foot? Should we use five foot? What does that really uncover to us? And I think what this exploration showed us is that we get almost 300 canopy square feet more with the five foot design that we lose a little bit of mobile aisle that we probably weren't fully utilizing anyway. 
the front aisle changes, we get more tier spacing, the cost goes down per square foot and for total materials and for install and some of these other factors. But again, you have to consider, is five foot the right choice for this customer? And in this case, you know, there's lots of solutions, different lighting solutions that we can talk through with them to make sure that they're optimizing the room as a whole. But this is a great example of how to get a couple more hundred square feet out of the same exact room. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, there's multiple things that we need to consider when we are designing these rooms outside of just the racks itself, you know, door locations. I mean, you'll look at these two designs and the, the configuration is completely different. Um, and you'll see one is v vertical in the room and horizontal in the other. And that, and that can be dictated by HVAC, door location, maybe SOPs, maybe client preference. Um, so that's something that we discuss and try to really get down to the bottom of with our clients. For the most part, when you consider the room design, you're thinking about airflow, supply return, workflow. And we're here to work through those things with you and figure out what the best decision for your build is, whether it's, you know, chasing a couple hundred extra canopy square feet um, or designing around optimized airflow. Either way, I think there's a lot of things to consider, which brings us to our next slide, which is tier spacing. Uh, a really important factor in understanding how to optimize the money you spend in the space. But Caitlin, you want to jump in here and talk about uh, some of the elements of tier spacing and how they impact CapEx or optimization? Yeah, absolutely. So the great thing about our system is super modular, right? For the most cases, we can build up to just about any height that our clients are looking to achieve. Now that does come with a cost, right? So we want to be, and I keep going back to this word intentional, we want to be intentional with our build and how we're designing these rooms. So it looks different for every Jack, Joe, Chad, whomever, um, depends on how big your plants are getting, how much space you want between tiers. But, you know, we we like to say an additional six, in six inches can potentially cost you 20% uh, cost increase in the overall project. So something definitely to keep in mind is like how, how big are your plants getting? How tall are your ceilings? What do we need to work around as far as ducting? Um, and we really want to set you up for success so we don't have any wasted space at any given point in this room. And one of the solutions we have at GrowGlide are telescopic uprights, right? Which allow us to take advantage of a couple inches here and there to really optimize the ceiling height. But at the same time, we want to make sure that we're dialing in the lights. And that's the second consideration in here that, you know, I bring up all the time of the racking optimizes airflow, lighting, fertigation, drybacks, all these other elements that you control too in the space. So let's make sure that we're setting our customers up for success there too. So you might want a little bit you know, more space if you're going with a higher wattage light, or if you're trying for higher PPFD, you might want less space. So the lights are closer to the plant and you're essentially staying within the set points and KPIs you think are most important with your racking design. Um, and then that leads us to other elements of the racking design, like drainage and tables, and slab trays and the elements that are actually going to hold the plants up. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about some of the options that we all consider with our customers regularly here, Caitlin? Yeah, absolutely. Part of part of our process with our clients is understanding the media in which they're using so that we can set them up for success. You know, if I throw a standard uh, or if I throw a living soil client on a standard tray and don't give them heavy duty supports, they're probably going to see pooling and I'm not setting them up for success and I'm going to have an unhappy client, I'm going to have unhappy plants, and I'm going to have an unhappy cultivator. So these are all things that we need to consider throughout the process as well. Um, another great thing or another great product, I'm sorry, that we launched recently these are slab trays. Jesse, I know these are one of your favorites because it increases air movement, but it's also a really good complement to our air glide system. Um, this is something I really enjoy seeing in a greenhouse setting, maybe on the upper tier, if you want to go two tier in a greenhouse, um, or if you're just looking at optimizing airflow within a room, um, slab trays are definitely one of the more popular solutions we offer. And lastly, a level wire decking. This is a fun one. I have some clients that get creative with this. This can be used anywhere from clone rooms, storage spaces. I have clients that that use wire decking and trays combined. Um, so really we can we can work with just about any cultivator's needs and we're not afraid of innovating if it's maybe not something or a solution that we've offered or worked with previously. Yeah, and I think, you know, for me, it's important to 
genuinely consider the cultivation style, like you said, what's the media, what's really going to be on this and how are they going to utilize this tool, which is exactly why I love talking about slab trays and bottom up airflow and boundary layers and CO2 assimilation and all these other opportunities. But the bigger picture here is really understanding what you're buying. You know, you might see another rack and quote where this isn't included. Or it is mm-hmm. concluded, included, but it's an inferior plastic or an inferior quality or the drain is built into the tray itself. So eventually you'll get pooling versus our drain is built into the racking system and the drainage is threaded and connected permanently. So just different elements of what's going on, whether it's a large you know, trays or slab trays or whatever tools that you're going to use, know what you're paying for, know what you're getting know if it's included or not, or if you're going to need to source it elsewhere. Um, Which again, brings us to other options in the space. When we talk about multi-tier indoor cultivation, we obviously need to talk about some way to access those tiers. So we have a lot of conversations about decking and maybe you can run with this a little bit in some of the decking considerations customers have in any multi-tier environment and specifically with Kirkwood. Yeah, safely maintaining your upper tier is is one of the most important things of going vertical, right? You you need your team to feel safe and secure on the upper tier. And how are you going to do that? Um, everybody looks a little bit differently. And I've seen multiple different solutions out there. Um, but our Grodex system is probably one of the most robust and safest, in my opinion, and it may be a little biased there, um, solutions out there. You know, we have everything from single wide to double wide solutions. I mean, if you're planning on just getting up there real quick and taking a look at your plants, you can set up a single wide, whereas a double wide solution, if you can go back to back and maintenance either side uh, with, with two different crews there. So being intentional with how we're building out uh, this system as well, um, because there's a few things that we can do here. We can uh, trial this in one room, build out one complete room. Our mounting brackets live on our system. So you'll want to build out each individual room with that, whereas our decks are transferable. I've had clients, you know, let me see the time savings in room one before I build out five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten rooms later. Um, and that's something that we can transition to later on. It's always an add-on that we can we can look at in the future. But really, uh, really knowing what you're getting and what's included. Whereas some of these competitors or some of our competitors may be including, you know, the minimal amounts on their quotes. It's knowing how to ask the right questions and what's included is, is going to be key in this process. Yeah. I think what's included is the fun part of this, right? You know, when you get into multi-tier cultivation, you might think, cool, I need some decks, but how many do you need and why do you need them and where are they going to go and where are they going to live? then leads you to side mounts. Like how are you going to get at the multi-tier on the outside, especially if you have five foot wide tables um, or anti-tip tracks in certain areas where the tracks are a certain height? Um, have you considered anti-tip tracks? And then what about ladder safety? Uh, you know, we have people on the team that talk about ladder safety all the time as it being super important. Or as we'll get to something like fan guards to keep your hands safe for in-rack airflow. Have you considered all the things that go into this vertical multi-tier and made sure that you're avoiding unnecessary redundancies while still getting exactly what you need? And you're going to know how to use what you need. And I think that's part of the fun part of the dialogue for me. Absolutely. And I, and I think that's one of the neat things that our team uh, does towards the end of the process, you know, as we're getting our clients operational is we have SOPs and we have maintenance manuals around all of this. So to your point, we are educating our clients on not only how to build our system or utilize our system, but safely um, continue that or standardize that throughout their teams. Right. There's safety and then there's optimization of the tool as well, like our air glide solution, which I think is something I'm just chomping at the bait to get to, as you know. I love this tool, right? Airflow has always been a challenge in multi-tier and it's so much different than single tier. Eliminating the microclimates, homogenizing leaf temperatures, driving the CO2 assimilation in the plant. They all sound great in theory, but then you get into the room and how are you going to do it? What tools exist in the space? Which ones have validation and which ones can I use? And that's why I love the AirGlide solution so much. Um, I think it pans out with CFD modeling and more importantly, it pans out when you put it into the space. And that's what we've really seen. 
I think, you know, me too, trying to close the loop on financials on all things we do, trying to understand the financial impact of homogenizing your climate, better air exchanges, better phenotypic expression. It's really hard. I mean, we're talking about controlling air in the space that's hard enough to measure with an anemometer. Um, so when I think about it, I think about, you know, can we eliminate microclimates and increase plant vitality to the point where you get one more gram a square foot? So one more gram a square foot in the facility we're talking about, 4,320 square feet in that double room design we had initially is nine and a half pounds, five and a half harvest a year, it's 53 pounds. And at 1,400 a pound, that's $73,920, which is a lot of money. So what's 10 grams? Maybe we see it in the gains because we're getting 85 grams a square foot. Maybe we get it in the savings because we're not losing that product to mold or mildew from the microclimates. But 10 grams a square foot, that's $740,000. It's enough to really consider what you're doing from an airflow perspective to make sure you're giving yourself the best chance for consistency, quality, quantity, and ultimately operational efficiency. But sorry, I just, you know me, I'm going to go off on airflow for a half an hour if you like. I know, right up your alley, Jesse. I always enjoy hearing you talk about it though. Um, you know, I mean, it, that's a great point. And how much is one gram, one more gram worth? And I, I'd like to discuss that a little, little further, especially around our design with the different room options that we had and just really look at the total canopy and what you're achieving through ROI through that. So as we continue to quantify, you know, what grams are worth, we're going from one gram to a larger scale, which is the design that we got floor plans for and we're building out. If we went single tier in the individual rooms, as you know, it would be less canopy. And if we went triple tier, it would be a lot more canopy. And Caitlin, these are sort of the fun exchanges I like to have with the customers. And I hope you do too. I know you do because I get good feedback, but it's really about talking them through what the CapEx and the ROI look like okay, hey, this build, single tier in both these rooms that we're talking about, 55 grams a square foot is a baseline yield metric, five and a half yields a year, $1,400 a pound. It's $2 million. Okay, is, does that make sense for your business plan, the asset you're building, repaying your investors? And oftentimes you find this two-tier honey hole. And that's where I think this conversation really leans is, yeah, but if we add this extra tier, the CapEx isn't double, it's a little bit more, and we're going to average $4 million a year with the same metrics. And then we get in there and play with the metrics with our customers. And I know you do this on your side too, where they're like, hey, what if I took away one table? What does that do to the canopy square footage? What does that do to the total yield? But for me, these are the fun conversations because even as a cultivator, you have to answer to a CFO that's thinking about a performa, an EBITDA, and hitting numbers. So this helps people sort of conceptualize in the facility planning stage, what they might actually be making at the end of the line from a top line revenue perspective. Absolutely. And while I would love to see everybody go three tier, it's not for everybody and it's not for every facility. So really uh, building this out based on the needs of, as you mentioned, your business model, uh, your facility, your SOPs, the cultivator um, the, around the CFO, really keeping that in mind or all, all aspects of that in mind when we're discussing you know, is two tier right for our client? Or do we really need to discuss going single tier and maybe building up with their business three, four years down the road, which is one of the nice things or nice features, I guess, about a product is we can start off single tier. It's the same system. It's the same base. And we can grow essentially with your business, whether that's two tier now or three tier later. So I think that's a great point. And it's just part of what Another part of what we unpack with our customers as we talk about this iterative process, there's a whole other list of things that we get to, right? From lead times to warranties to how are we going to ship this and how are we going to get there? Um, they're all really important conversations. And they all play a factor in the, the decision-making process. Some of these conversations can be challenging, right? Talking about lead times, talking about what installation looks like and the options, talking about what the warranty looks like and freight and tax. I think those are all things that we want to make sure we cover with the customer, in addition to other fear points or questions that they have. But this isn't simply a rack that you go 
pickup at the corner Home Depot. Right? This is a purpose-built solution for multi-tier and single-tier indoor cultivation. And that means that we want to make sure it's exactly what you want and exactly what you need. And that's the overview we're trying to encapsulate here is, you know, it's the whole process from floor plans to a bunch of decisions that are interconnected to options, add-ons, subtractions, and iterations. But Caitlin, I know you work a lot with accounts management and the rest of the team here at GrowGlide and Fulfillment. I'd love for you to just talk at a high level about when these things come into play and some of the importance of them. Yeah, I mean, outside of the the racks that you're choosing or the trays you're utilizing to support your plans, uh, we really need to know, um, you know, what what timeline are you working with? When is your GC going to have that facility ready? When can we expect the walls to be up, doors to be in? And let's back into that and really discuss that as far as our timeline for lead times or installation. I mean, the beauty in it is, I mean, we can either install it, supply the labor, or you can do it yourself. And really building around what our clients' needs are is is our main goal here. As far as warranty and compliance, I mean, this is something that you need to verify is considered an other other solutions that you're shopping around as well. I mean, when you're looking at a quality product, it might not be as important, but knowing that you have the support and backing of the company and brand that you you chose is really, really important. As far as freight and tax, you, you know the game. Tax, I mean, knowing your options, ag tax exempt forms, uh, or whatever discounts you can get out there. Keeping that in mind throughout the process is extremely important. And then uh, as always, just quality. To, I, I say this all the time. Stop thinking about the now. Start thinking about five to 10 years from now. What are your goals for your building and, and your business? That's great. Um, I appreciate that rundown, especially landing on quality. You know, there's places where you can cut corners and then there's places where you build foundational pillars of the asset that you're trying to run for 10 years or sell or get money for. And when I think about downtime, you know, it's, it's easy coming from the world of HVAC and understanding lighting and thinking about these things being down, but I wanted to sort of play that same exercise when it came to racking. So we've got these two rooms that at two tier, 4,320 square feet, we know the baseline metrics that we've been assuming, 55 grams a square foot and $1,400 a pound. So what does it cost if one of these rooms goes down? Tracks break, drive systems don't work. We've got rust, we need to paint. We need to do something in the room because of the racks. Well, you know, if you're down for a whole run, it's $732,000. And I hear what you're saying. I'm not going to be down for the whole run. I only need to be down for what? A week? $91,000. A day? $13,000. Being down for one hour in both of these rooms, $545 an hour or $9 a minute. And I know you're still going to hit me and say, well, that's both rooms. Okay. It's probably going to occur in both rooms if it occurs in one, but let's just say it's one room. That's still $4 and 50 cents a minute in your flower room that's producing half a million dollars that you're losing. And it comes down to warranty and compliance, right? Making sure you choose a partner that's going to support you along the way, but also just investing in better quality purpose-built components. So that stuff happens less. And that's one of the ideas behind calculating downtime and understanding the cost of not being operational, which is why we focus on such quick flips to get that five and a half cycles a year. Well, what if you only got four cycles a year because your racks are down? Cost you a lot of money. Yeah, and well, that's extremely important. Important, I agree with you on the the quality of the components you're choosing. I think this is also these are also really important numbers for our clients to consider in the decision making process when they are working with a company or a brand. You know, how long is it taking them to come to this decision or get through this process? Because I mean, looking at these numbers here, it's costing them thirteen thousand dollars a day. It's a really good point. You know, paralysis can be really expensive. You can miss opportunities in the market. You can miss market share because price declines. Um, and I usually say, if you're going to act, hurry up and act, hurry up and get it built. So you're getting this revenue, getting this 732,000 or whatever piece of it you can get as quickly as possible. So you can continue to refine. And we're just looking at two rooms today. 
And maybe that's two more rooms in the future that's phase two or six more rooms in the future that's phase two. But whatever you can learn here is a mistake you won't make in those future phases. Um, so the more you, you know, really try to think about all the components involved and the financial impacts that they make, it becomes a lot easier to make that decision and you can make it faster. And that's what we really try to do at GrowGlide, provide a lot of information, scientific, business, closing the loop on financials, as well as material information to really streamline that decision-making process. Absolutely. And I mean, you hear me say it all the time, Jesse, I'm not going to sit here and pretend like I know everything or tell a, a cultivator how to how to maintain their garden. But I will say this is something as far as racking that we do every day. And we're here to educate our clients and walk them through this process. It's not something they're going to do alone or we're going to let them fail. Um, you know, really educating our clients on how to be successful with our system is key. Yeah, it's a great point. I mean, that is our goal is to look people in the eye one, two, three, four, five, 10 years from now and celebrate their successes with them, celebrate their journey and their struggles because we all have ups and downs, but know that we supported them the whole way. And they ran our racks for multiple years and, you know, they've got the scars to show it, but they're still functioning. They're still working and we're still great friends and allies and partners in this bigger game. And, you know, we always try to end with a bang, but the idea is if your racks don't do business, neither do you. Like those racks have to work for you to make capital. Whether they're our racks or someone else's racks, whatever it is, these plants are going to grow on racks. So choose a partner that gives you the most uptime, gives you the most purpose built design that lets you optimize phenotypic expression, lets you optimize yield, lets you optimize labor with solutions like decking or fan guards protecting your employees. There's so many elements of it. And that's why it takes a little bit of time. But for those ready to plan um, and have a good facility layout, we're excited to talk. Absolutely, Jesse. I couldn't have said it better myself. So, Caitlin, when a customer comes to you uh, here at Grow Glide, like, what's your approach? You've used the word intentional. Can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah. So, I mean, really, I just like to take the facts and that's the facility layout and design. And, you know, what does your building look like? Where are the walls? Where are the doors? Where's the dehues, the HVAC? And having the creativity to back in their racking design so that they can maximize every inch of their build um, with no wasted space or wasted material for that matter. The last thing that I want to do is set somebody up for 14 foot tall racks when they're really only looking at five foot tall plants um, and having all that wasted space between tiers. You know, being operationally efficient and maximizing your canopy, you can have both. You don't have to sacrifice either or for one or the other. That's a really big misconception. Um, you can have your cake and eat it here too. You just need a brand that uh, has product intimacy and isn't scared of in innovation. And to piggyback on that intention, sometimes we get feedback of like, wow, like, why are you guys asking me so many questions? I just want a racking quote. Their point is like, it's not a commodity style racking quote, right? We really want to understand how much space you want off the back wall, the front mm -hmm. wall, what your mobile aisle looks like, what your tier spacing looks like, what your top of rack height looks like, so we can dial it in. And that's all part of this relationship with whatever racking provider you get into business with is, you know, helping each other. And if your racking provider can't really help you understand how to optimize all the other things you're going to buy in this space, um, then are they really bringing value beyond just racks? Absolutely. Every decision you make has a cost impact and understanding that or educating our clients how to understand that is, is key. Awesome, guys. Thank you so much for this presentation. I feel like you really unpacked a lot of the process and decision making that goes into selecting a racking provider. It's not really, it's not just about the racks, it's about everything else that goes in your room and choosing a provider, a partner that can help you along the way in all aspects, including racking, um, is really key. It's really instrumental for success. So thank you so much for that. So at this time, we will um, end the presentation, then open it up for Q&A. I see there's some questions in the queue. So uh, let's get started. I think you're muted, Will. Will, I don't have audio on you. Not bad. 
<laughs> you'd think by now people wouldn't be on mute when they start talking on Zoom or a webinar. But anyway, so uh, thank you for joining us today, everyone, and for watching our presentation. We do have some questions here, so let's just dive right in and let uh, Jesse and Caitlin address these. We have a question from Elliot. He's enjoying the room generator and building potential rooms of all sizes. Air glide and lights are not available options in the sing single tier builds. Will this be a future option? Caitlin, can you kind of field that and explain, you know, the single tier options on that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, great question, Elliot. Um, while that's not an option currently on our room gen tool, it is a solution that we do offer on our single tier uh, racks. So we can actually add light lids that will allow you to hang your lights from our racks on a single tier solution, as well as add air glide. Um, now I can say that we are working on future iterations of our room gen tool, um, and I'll definitely add this to the queue as something we'd like to add. So thank you so much for your input and you know for utilizing our tools, I appreciate it. And I think to piggyback on that, Elliot, great question, because we're always trying to be innovative at Grow Glide, and I'm not trying to let the cat out the bag, but we are always trying to make airflow better and optimize the way our racks are utilized in the space from an efficiency perspective and empowering growers to really achieve the metrics and KPIs that they're looking for. So um, while you might not see something on the room gen, know that you can always call us up and talk through the options that might not be readily available online to really dial in your grow and dial in your racking quote. Great question. Yeah, thanks, Jesse and Kaylin. Um, yeah, in the room gen, that tool is constantly evolving and we're you know continuously adding features, releasing new versions. So be on the lookout for that in the near future. Um, Ron Morton also asked a question. Is there an educational program that allows clients to engage with Groglight systems to maximize their systems? Um, while, um, or while Jesse, you want to take this one? Okay, I'm <laughs> uh, sorry about that. Um, while there's not necessarily an educational program per se, um, we do that during the sales process or tour or I, with the process with our clients. You know, the last thing I want to do is tell a grower how to grow, but I will guide you through things I've seen our clients be successful with. You know, I'll I'll warn you of the dangers when you're going into a danger zone, but I'll kind of let you make those decisions and just provide you all the facts throughout it so you can make an informed decision. Um, but yeah. That's about it. That's about it. <laughs> it's a great question, Ron, trying to load us up to drop educational content. But at the same time, it's all connected, right? As much as we want to sit down and have some sort of validation process for truly understanding racking, we know there's so many things connected. So if you haven't yet, check out a few episodes of Ask the Growbot, our po biweekly podcast that brings on guests outside of the racking space to talk about the combined value proposition of lighting plus racking or fertigation plus racking or whatever it might be that their expertise is. And in addition, we try to take a biweekly deep dive into white papers and the science and the research of cannabis cultivation that current cultivators are using to game up their grows and increase their operational efficiency. So while racks are a huge component that dictate a lot of the other efficiencies in the space, we do know that it's connected. So we encourage everyone to, you know, get as much information as you possibly can. And then we can have a real deep conversation about how you're going to utilize the racks, how you're going to spend money to make money and how elements are. And once we start pulling one string, we'll know how it influences the other. And we can sort of one hand wash the other kind of thing and um, use all the information in the space to take advantage of every dollar you spend. Thanks, Jesse. Um, I, I do have some follow-up questions. There aren't any, any other questions in the queue here from the audience, but but please submit your questions. We still have some time left, so but I'll, I'll give you guys a couple more follow-up questions here. Uh, here's a good one. Um, at what point in, in the facility design should you start thinking about racks? Caitlin? Great question. And, you know, racking will really impact everything else in your facility. So it should be at the start of your decision making process, you know, right when you're picking out a facility and, you know, designing the rooms, you should be thinking about a racking solution and provider and the design that's going to fit inside those rooms because that will impact your HVAC, your power, your lighting, et cetera. So it should really be at the start of the process. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Everyone. Everyone. 
Um, hey, Jess, can you turn hey, on Jess, your camera? Can you turn on your camera? Your camera? <laughs> Technology, love and hate it. Yeah, yeah. But I'll, I'll say like, you know, yeah. as far as understanding that impact of the decisions you make in racking, let's be honest, right? It's an order of magnitude canopy calculation. So once you understand how many racks and how many tiers fit into a room, you know how much canopy your facility is going to cultivate. Then you know how big your veg should be to support the flower. You can put some yield numbers on paper, whether it's a 55 grams a square foot average or 65, and start to understand what your performa looks like, what your top line revenue looks like. With total canopy, you'll know exactly how many lights you need to light that canopy. You'll know exactly how much HVAC you need. So that's why I really encourage people to talk about racks early, get that canopy number, and maybe pursue an AB option. So you have a decision over here that is 50 to 75 tons of HVAC and one over here that's 100 to 120. Because realistically, when you go in search of an HVAC quote or solution, you're going to need to know what the total canopy is in order for them to do latent load calculations in order for any HVAC provider to recommend the appropriate performance to control that space. And then again, like Caitlin mentioned earlier in the webinar, do you plan to start single tier and add a second tier later? What are the impacts of that? And how do you plan for that now with supply return configurations and future pads that you can pour now and stub outs that you can do that save you a lot of money in the future, knowing that you'll get there once you get to uh, operation and uh, making money? Great. Thank you, Jesse. Um, Jesse, you also touched on airflow a lot in the webinar. Can you talk about some of the differences in HVACD you need for multi-tier versus single tier? Versus single tier? We could do a whole nother webinar on airflow. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm just sure. running my mouth talking about the science and the application into these facilities. But yeah, I think that's a common uh, conversation that I have with friends and peers and architects and engineers designing facilities is what is the difference between single tier and multi-tier and how do we effectively homogenize leaf conditions and achieve the KPIs and metrics that we're looking for? And I think from a 10,000 foot view in a single tier environment, it's actually easier to control airflow. Let's dump some CO2 rich conditioned air in the space and circulate it in a cyclonic fashion and try and make sure that we're circulating air fast enough that the conditions that the plant sees are really consistent. Now that's easy because we don't have racks in the way of that airflow. So it's easy to have a cyclonic action. Whereas in multi-tier, it's actually much more appropriate as you see in the CFD model here to dump the majority of air into the front of the room or at least get that conditioned CO2 rich air to the front where we can utilize the air glide solution or any in-rack airflow solution to capture that air move it through the lights, through the plants, towards the back of the room, and think about turning that cyclone on its side and running it through multi-tiers of racking to homogenize the conditions. If we don't, it's very likely that if we take the same airflow solution or same approach as a single tier, that the bottom tier and the top tier will have a delta in leaf temperature, that they're gonna see different levels of CO2, and thus they'll grow differently. So you lose some consistency you lose some granularity of control. So in short, really, it's it's about understanding where the supply return configurations are gonna be, how much canopy you're gonna have, how much air you need to move, and how fast you need to cycle it through the space. And that'll help you settle on where we're gonna put the supply return configurations to get the most out of a single tier or a multi-tier. It's not that one is more complicated than the other, it's that we really need to understand, is this single tier or is this multi-tier and take distinctly different approaches to solving the problems and pain that occur in those two spaces. Thanks, Jesse. Um, here's another one. Um, Caitlin, maybe you can help out with this one. So how many tiers can we go? Uh, really, I don't know that I've seen a limit there. I've seen clients do everything from five tiers in a clone space to three tiers in flower. Um, we don't have limitations on our end that I've seen thus far. I'd be really open to looking into this further, discussing how it would look on a specific facility. 
but really it depends on the parameters of the facility, the ceiling heights, um, you know, the canopy that you're looking to achieve, the, the business plan and model that you have built out. I mean, we'll kind of back into it that way. Yeah, that makes sense. So kind of start with the goals and work backwards from that for mm -hmm. each cultivator, knowing obviously each cultivator, each project is, is unique, right? So um, let me see what we have here. Um, how long does it take to install our racks? That's a little bit more. <laughs> That's a fun one. Uh, there's a lot that goes into this, uh, where we're conducting room measurements, doing inventory counts, you know, setting the build up for success. It's also dependent on, you know, whether we're supplying the labor or our clients are providing their own. Um, I don't have an exact formula for you, uh, but I would say that on an individual project, I'd say two rooms maybe 2,500 to 5,000 square feet would maybe take about five days to give a ballpark idea. Gotcha. Jess, you have anything to add on that or are you good? No, I think that's a great answer. We all know that there's lots of variables involved and there's multiple different ways to do it. And again, that's something that we want to talk through. We want to make sure that the floors are flat and finished mm -hmm. and that we're on the same page with the certain checklist that needs to be checked off before we really start the install so we can seamlessly continue. There's trades, there's all kinds of factors that need to play into it. But if we can get our ducks in a row before we start, then any small obstacles that come up are easily overcome in the installation process. Okay, thank you guys. I was gonna keep pitching you guys some questions here. Um, so when it comes to drainage, I think Jesse, um, maybe you can feel this. So when it comes to drainage, do you think floor drains or raised gutters? Or better you know they both work right it's a matter of understanding what's going into the facility design what the budget looks like and what the SOPs look like um, we've heard people say that it's a challenge to clean floor drains and as a result they will avoid that solution others however have wonderful SOPs that have kept them operating for years without buildup of fungal pathogens in that particular floor drain I do like the idea of having a floor drain visible so it's easy to clean, not out of sight, out of mind. But at the same time, I think it really depends on what that cultivator is looking for. The reason it's important is that the location of the floor drain might be impacted by the racking layout or the tracks that we lay down. Same thing goes with an above ground drain. Uh, if it's off the back wall or on the side, we need to account for that. Is it six inches? Is it 12 inches? Is it two and a half feet that we need to give ourselves a berth so we can access that to effectively clean? There are a lot of different ways to design a facility that can be maintained successfully year in and year out. But it is about considering these impacts and building the SOPs and understanding what it's gonna take from a top-down leadership perspective to not just build this out, but implement the long-term uh, maintenance and management of the facility. I really like floor drains because then I can just squeegee everything into the floor and it's a lot simpler. But at the same time, uh, we've seen both designs work in, in addition to other creative solutions as well. The point is, is that everything drains to universally threaded one inch pipe. So you can hardline this thing out of the building or to a sump or to a cleaning station or whatever you feel is appropriate. We can work with whatever creative solution you have. We just want to hear about the creative solution so we don't show up for install and all of a sudden we determine we can't use the extra four feet of racks that you wanted to pursue initially because we have to account for drainage. Right. All right. Thank you. You know, Jesse, we talked about some numbers and calculations in our deck here, and I think it'd probably be worth going back to some of that and uh, kind of diving in a bit, little bit deeper into how one gram is worth $73,000 and what's the thought process behind that? Let's just review that one and then we'll also review about the downtime one next. So let's just kind of so take, a look at them. take a look at these numbers. Sure. And to be fair, there's a little bit of shock and awe with these numbers, right? I want people to truly understand the value of the cannabis that you're growing. And as a historic cultivator, this is something I did a lot, right? What's a gram worth? Well, you're not going to go into a dispensary and buy a gram for $73,000. We all know that. But when we're talking about ideas in the space of facility design, you also can't say, I think this is a good idea. And when someone asks you why, say, I don't know, or I have a gut feeling. 
you really have to find a defendable position in the science or the business math. And in this case, we're just trying to illustrate the fact that what if you took this facility and you were able to get one more gram per canopy square foot out of it, whether that's optimizing the photosynthetic activity of the plant via the lights and PPFD management, whether that's maintaining optimal leaf conditions or driving CO2 through the stomata uh, by getting airflow in the appropriate places. What is that extra gram per square foot worth? And we've seen cultivators implement our air glide solution into a relatively stagnant grow environment and increase their yield across the entire canopy by 10 grams a square foot, which brings us to the larger number of $740,000. The idea being is that once we get really granular, let's try and understand what the impacts are of the solutions that you're buying. The money that you're investing is truly an investment. What do we expect to get back? One more gram a square foot, two more grams a square foot, or maybe we just don't lose five grams a square foot. I think that's a big one too. A lot of times we talk about risk reduction like it's a mythology. But risk reduction is a gram per canopy square foot that we're not losing to mold or mildew or aspergillus or whatever testing uh, that it might fail. And instead, we're driving phenotypic expression. We're getting better bag appeal. And we're not even talking about what does a quality increase look like? What if we brought out more color? What if we tested higher for terps or THC? Does that get us $100 more per pound? What does that pencil out? Conceptually here, we're really just trying to quantify the impact of a grant. Yeah, they add up, especially across, you know, in one room with, you know, over, you know, 3,000 square feet of canopy. And then you multiply that across multiple rooms and multiple facilities. You know, that one little gram means a lot. So let's fast forward to the, um, to the other slide where we talk about the downtime, because I think this is a real eye opener as well. You know, you think you're going to be down for a day or so because you got to reset or what have you, but it makes an impact. Even every minute makes an impact. Yeah, this is one of those metrics that became really important to me when I was thinking about turning over rooms, right? If it takes you 24 hours or it takes you three days to turn over room, there's a time cost there where you're not effectively putting new plants in, loading them in and optimizing their production. So what does that time cost you? And the same applies to downtime. If we can't flower in this room, we can't start a cycle that puts us behind. And now instead of five and a half or 5.8 cycles a year, we're only gonna get five. And what does that do to our bottom line? What does that do to the operational efficiency and EBITDA of the whole facility? So in this case, we really just wanted to take this example of these rooms that we're building out and say, what if they did go down? What if you chose the wrong partner? What if they supplied inferior racking? What if everything rusted and bent and fell apart? Well, there's a cost to having to go in and replace that, whether it's retrofit or facility assessment or just painting and fixing the racks in the facility. And to be clear, again, I wanted to show a large number of what it would cost if everything went wrong and both of these rooms were down for the entirety of their time. Okay, that's an expensive mistake. But the reality is, is that there's a minute by minute cost associated with you know, downtime and a loss of opportunity that you're not taking advantage of. So maybe that nine minutes or $4.50 per minute per room doesn't seem like a lot. But when you think about Christmas bonuses, you think about investing in bigger HVAC, you think about investing in systems integration, you think about building a brand or investing in marketing that you think you need to truly expand your market share. This is where it lies. And if you can keep this as a minimum, have the least amount of downtime possible, most amount of up optimum per square foot, like we talked about earlier, then you're going to be in a position to be a really strong asset from borrowing capital to paying your employees and employee retention, or just being able to serve the customer better that ultimately ends up consuming your product. If you're down for a week or down for a month, your product's hot on the shelf and it sells out. No one can get it. And what happens when I can't get your product? I'm going to try a different one. And all of a sudden, you might have lost me as a customer. So consistency and uptime are critical. And downtime costs you a lot of money, as you can see here. But it also might cost you the sell-through numbers and customers in the long term if you're not consistently producing product with purpose-built solutions that you invest in. Yeah, that's a really good point, the impact on retail. If you're not producing, it's not on the shelf. 
customer goes somewhere else. So it just has ramifications really in, in all aspects of your operation. So I know this presentation was very specific on cannabis, obviously. Uh, Jesse, can you talk a little bit about how we work with, you know, uh, companies in the ag space as well with our systems? Yeah, I think we feel really strongly about the iterative process and talking with our customers early and often about what their goals are and what they're trying to achieve. And while tier spacing might be different for leaf lettuce and sprouted greens, the racks still support growth in the vertical environment. So truly understanding what the goals are of our customers and helping set them up for success is, is fun. And for me, as you know, as a spending my entire career in cannabis, I love talking cannabis, but I also enjoy the challenge of strawberry runneries or truly optimizing flavonoids in basil because it gets you more money. It's about understanding what the goals are. And a lot of times we see these vertical indoor cultivation facilities five, six, seven, 12 tiers high. And there's lots of questions about airflow and fertigation and management of this canopy the same way there is cannabis. And one thing we can say is that in cannabis, it's grueling and the margins are tough and you really have to be on top of the data you're collecting in order to be successful. So in a lot of ways, what I share with ag space cultivators that come to us is Hey, we can use the same tools. You can use an anemometer. You can use a tensiometer. You can use a PAR meter to truly understand how the other things you've invested in the space are impacting your bottom line. Um, it's just a matter of understanding what your goals are, applying the tools, getting the granular data, and then making a really informed decision on where you're going to invest your capital in order to grow your brand, your company, or your farm, whatever it is that you're growing. Thanks, Jesse. Um, so I don't see any additional questions, um, uh, from the, from the room here and we're, you know, we're getting close to time. I want to be respectful of everybody's time here. So we're going to start wrapping it up. Um, Caitlin, Jesse, do you guys have any closing, you know, uh, statements or anything else you'd like to say? Maybe Caitlin. Yeah. Um, racking, you know, really is the building block foundation of your facility. And with the climate of the current industry, it's these building blocks mean that much more. You know, choosing a partner that is going to innovate and not be afraid to innovate and continuously grow is important. So, I mean, as you're making these decisions, I would keep that top of mind and just look for quality over quantity and think about the five, 10 years out rather than the now. Thank you, Caitlin. Thank you, Caitlin. Yeah, I would say this this statement might make some people cringe, but we don't sell <laughs> racks, right? We provide operational efficiency. We help facilities take space and optimize it. And as a result, that pans out into a huge financial impact for cultivation. We just want to help make sure that people are making the most informed decisions along the way. And for me, that's the fun part is really talking through the nuts and the bolts and the options and the opportunities that we all have together, whether it's sharpening pencils and cutting fat or adding things that truly optimize workflow or phenotypic expression. Um, I, I really believe that it's about quality, quantity, consistency and operational efficiency. And in order to get there, you need to commit to a racking provider that can be with you the long haul, but also optimize at every stage of the way and understand all the factors, whether it's media, fertigation, lighting, airflow, how those investments impact what you're going to do. So we can get more grams per square foot. We can grow better wheat. We can make more money. We can employ more people. We can satisfy more customers. And every year when we get together at MJ Biz, we can look each other in the eye and celebrate. Fantastic. Thank you, Jesse. So with that said, <clears throat> I want to thank everyone for registering and joining us today. We hope you found this uh, webinar uh, valuable and uh, we'll see you next time. This will be a part of a series. So we'll be putting a, another webinar in the coming months. Thank you so much for joining us today.